So it is now one o'clock. Thanks for coming. I guess this is for most people your first, I mean, it's kind of like a pre-talk since the conference isn't really starting until tomorrow, but in any case, welcome to the Zephyr in You talk. It's a, about a developer environment for newcomers and by newcomers it's gonna be. Um, it's gonna be specifically in the context of using a Linux environment. So I'm sorry to the Windows users, I know you're out there, but it, it's a struggle, we're working on it. And it's gonna be with Visual Studio Code. Um, and I'm going to show you some tips to kind of like streamline your development workflow. And you don't need to know a whole bunch about Zephyr. Um, just like you need to know about Linux, obviously, and a little bit about Visual Studio Code. Um, and this is mostly for contributors, but I think it'll also be useful for users. Um, this is not a tutorial, so don't freak out if you can't follow along. And I, I can see the people in the audience. There's a lot of people who have a, their laptops out for following this presentation. I'm assuming that y'all are not doing that, so don't worry about it. Um, we're going to go really fast, and the materials for most of the Visual Studio, uh, Visual Studio Code customization will be posted after. So, yeah, um, and I'm Lauren. I'm from Intel, and i uh junior software engineer um, on their FMOS last Zephyr RTOS team. So you'll see me around um, in terms of, like, Intel stuff, extensive stuff, audio stuff, possibly. So let's get started. So we'll do a really quick survey. Raise your hand if you use Visual Studio Code for development with Zephyr. Specifically, okay. Um, anyone use Visual Studio with Zephyr? No, okay. Then I see the the real hardcore people. Does anyone use Emacs? Oh my God, I love y'all, Emacs users. Unite. Okay, Control C. Yeah. Um, anyone use Eclipse? God forbid. Okay. I'm I'm sure there's other stuff. Like I really don't know what's going on with platform IO. I'm sure there's someone out there using Notepad plus plus. But <laughs> anyway, so before I begin, some general resources for beginners. The documentation is always excellent. I highly recommend it. It is a plus. Um, the mailing lists are great. The Discord is also fantastic. We're a real Discord server because we at least have ten or more anime profile pictures in the server. So that's great. Um, at least online at any given time. I don't know how many there are. Uh, in general, I'm sure there's a lot, uh, but the de developer um, environment channel is great. The user experience, the new user experience working group, I would say get involved if you want to make some changes there. And if you're having problems with CI, hit up the CI channel. Uh, and I mean like problems like it seems broken to you. Um, and there's also, it's helpful to search issues in PRs. Um, I found out um, Goliath has this unofficial repo with like awesome Zephyr RTOS support and stuff. So check that out too. So in terms of setting up your environment, we all know about the, the Linux environment variables. These are the three most important ones. And I'm pretty sure you need to have these set. There may have been some kind of like dark time when you could get away with not using Zephyr base, but this, this is not that way anymore. Um, but you also have some variables that you normally would pass into West that you can actually set in the command line. Like if you're only using one board, which contributors usually don't, but if you're a user, you may want to just set the board environment variable and that way you don't have to pass it into West every time. Uh, there's also like tool chain specific variables, et cetera. So if you're having issues, I find it's really helpful to just kind of like print out your entire environment for whatever Linux distro the command that is um, and grep for Zephyr. In terms of bash scripting, I would recommend that you source the Zephyr M script um, just in your bash or see that's, you know, it's not like rocket science. Um, but if you're feeling a little bit more adventurous, you can also supply some commands in the Zephyr RSC file in your home directory because that will be run when Zephyr M is sourced. Uh, I would also recommend that you source West completion. I found out about this like yesterday, um, that it will actually auto-complete the boards for you, which is great because I like using a bunch of different Kimu boards. Um, I would also recommend that if you switch between different environments, like I will use uh, Expressive, and then I have a really complicated um, Intel ADSP audio setup with like XCC, it's a, it's a huge mess, but I just have one single command to turn it on and off and it's great, so. Um, some other commands you might alias, I actually have a go home command to go to the Zephyr base, which is great. Uh, I use it a lot, like every day, all the time. So in terms of your Python environment, I, like do as I say, not as I do here, because my Python environment is a mess. So first off, 3.6 or higher, that's the bare requirement. Use a virtual environment in your Zephyr base and install with user because if you try installing into the Ubuntu system Python and you're installing some like really old package and you try to like resolve the dependencies, you end up uninstalling a bunch of stuff, your Ubuntu will break and you won't be able to get it back to the way it was. There's no amount of changes that you can do to repair the damage. So just take like, you know, live your best lives. Don't live like me. I live in danger every day. So 
there's a lot of Visual Studio Code extensions that are great to work with. Um, I recommend, of course, the device tree for the Zephyr project. I don't use it often, but I do use Cake and Pick a lot because it auto suggests and auto completes stuff for me. Um, I don't know if it really, if it, yeah, if you, um, one other thing you can do with the Cake and Fig extension is you can hover over Cake and Figs and it will show you the definition, the uh, documentation for it, which is really handy if you don't want to pull up the docs or go into Ninja. So I think that's great. <clears throat> In general, some helpful extensions are GitLens. If you're a contributor, like, I don't know how you live without this. C, C++ is required. Well, I mean, not really, but I, I think it's required. You know, otherwise, what are you doing? Um, Python and PyLance, which is helpful if you're debugging, like, build scripts or your own scripts for your environment. Um, the hex editor, just so you can just see what's going on with the hex. And personally, I like One Dark Pro and VS Code icons in terms of just icons because uh, it just looks, it just really, it's like a morale builder. You can see it's, like, so colorful. When I was at my dad's house for the pandemic, because I hadn't graduated college yet, um, he saw me working with this theme on. He's like, oh, it's a bunch of jelly beans. So it's nice. So I think about that every time that I log in. It's just all a bunch of colors. There's like basically nothing white there. So, so here's the really exciting part of the talk. C++ IntelliSense in Visual Studio Code. It's a little janky. It's a little weird, but it's really handy to be able to click through code instead of like control shift effing and going all over the place or having to set up cscope having being able to click through definitions in the same way you would in intellij is it's just really great so um but first thing you need to make sure that west is generating compile commands which is what supports a lot of that and you need to set up your c cpp properties.json and you need to of course install the c++ extension so um, I found out also recently that one of our intel developers came up with a script to set all this up so I have a link to that so your development workflow. Um, I mean, I don't think this is, if you're a user, you may figure this out quickly, but I just wanted to let people know that you don't need to use the same manifest. Like we, when you install Zephyr, you have the Zephyr project folder, then you have Zephyr, and then you have the modules. And you may be working with your project outside of that. But the thing about West is that the manifest, um, let's think it's the west.yaml is the name, right? you can create your own manifest repository or use your app as the manifest repository to override um, the SHA commits of certain modules that come in. So if you need to bring in like your own modules, like your own projects, or you want to use specific versions of existing open source modules, this is really helpful for you because maybe you can't work with the current version of TensorFlow that we have. You want to work with an older one. You want to work with a newer one. This is helpful for you. So I would recommend you read up on the topologies. In terms of West builds, I just, you know, one thing that you learn after kind of messing around with stuff is that it may be helpful to just have the P option on if you're making any kind of changes because, like, this is for really new developers, honestly. Um, sometimes you think something isn't a big code change and it ends up being a big code change. And then if you don't compile it completely from scratch, you don't see the change. And then later you find the change, so it's going to be a problem. Um, I can tend to be a little bit paranoid. I just remove the whole build folder, which is probably what... Christine is doing in the background, honestly, but I just do it sometimes anyways, because it soothes me emotionally. So um, one thing that's really helpful for me if I'm trying to debug issues with West, because occasionally there are issues and it's kind of hard to see, there's like 150, I think, steps, 150, not like steps specifically, but 150 commands that run when you're compiling, give or take. So if you want to see what all those commands are, I would highly recommend that you turn on the verbose option. So there's three levels for the three Vs, and you can put that into a build.log, and you can, uh, what that does there is that funnels the standard error into the standard out and puts it into the build.log. So if you want to see exactly what commands are running, it's really helpful, I'd recommend. So this is just kind of like common sense stuff, but we're trying to get all the common sense into like a 30-minute presentation here. So in terms of setting a macro for one build, this may be helpful if you want to just like set one macro or one config just for one run or one build. It's helpful. You can also pass in different config files. You can see this with the tests and samples. We have a lot of different config files to test different cases. And I think this is also a very like extremely useful thing. You can pass in the save temps flag to the compiler using the D extra C flags CMake argument, which is helpful for if you need to understand what's going on with like a macro, like how is it expanding, what's happening? Because frequently, especially with coding compliance issues like Misra, the bug is in 15,000 different layers. And when I say bug, I mean the violation of the coding guidelines. So I'd recommend that you read the West Building and Flashing 
documentation in detail. I think it's just an interesting read. So this is going to be a little bit, I'm not going to explain this whole diagram because it's very threatening, honestly, I know. Um, but if you were to understand this whole diagram, I promise you that your life as a Zephyr developer, specifically as a contributor, it's going to be a lot easier. Or rather, at some point, it becomes a requirement. So we have kconfig and kconfig. I mean, if you don't already know, it's our configuration. It's the a bunch of variables that have values and they get translated to macros, but they're called kconfig. And they translate into an autoconf.h, which is the header. And that's included pretty much everywhere by default. Um, so if you want to change kconfig values, obviously you go into the kconfig files or you change your own project.conf for the application. And that gets put into one universal kconfig file, which is in your build folder called .config. And you can take a look at that um, with GUI config or menu config using Ninja. Um, I also have this tool called harden config, which you can, I mean, it's not like super cool or anything, but you can run it to see what con uh, configs that you have on, which are not helpful, which may be security risks or vulnerabilities, like you don't have Stack Canary on, or you have any kind of logging or debugging information in your app, you want to turn that off. So that's useful. Um, if you want to understand what's going wrong with device tree, as I frequently have to do because I you know, do something in device tree, I don't really know what's going on. If you want to see the full expansion of device tree language into macros, because the device tree language is basically just a compressed version of all those macros, you can take a look at the device tree on fixed file. And if you want to know what um, what's the compiler is actually doing, again, you could also use the triple V, but if you want to understand like all of the names of the different commands and what's going on, you can check out the build.ninja or the rules.ninja. That's helpful. Oh, that's the configuration phase. You can see the configuration phase doesn't actually compile anything, but it gets ready for compilation. We have the header files that generates those and the config, et cetera. So the build phase, the actual build phase, I won't show you the diagram because there's like five of them, but I, like I said, I would really recommend that you, it's actually really complicated and very cool the way we build Zephyr. But here are some important files. So the west.yaml, when you're building, when you are about to build and you've pulled the latest Zephyr, one thing that you need to do if you're using modules is that you need to update the modules to the SHA that's in the Zephyr repos, west.yaml. Because if you don't run west update after you do a git pull and pull down main, you'll have the older version of the modules. And I've never really run into problems using the older version of the modules, but you may, if you're trying to specifically work with that module, it, it may cause problems with the newest code. So I would say that that's important to, before you build, do West Update if you pulled. Um, Zephyr.map, also helpful. If you want to see exactly what the linker is doing, which can be helpful if you're doing linker-related code, linker command, um, yeah. Otherwise, just read the build system documentation. I really cannot recommend it enough. It's actually really interesting stuff. Um, wow. We're like 12 minutes in. That's crazy. I might actually have time for questions. So we're here at the demo section. Um, yeah, we're like basically at the end. This is not how fast it went when I was, uh, yeah, anyway. So we'll talk about um, regular debugging. So obviously we all know how to use GDB, but uh, Zephyr does it in a specific way. If you want to run GDB, like kind of quote unquote directly on the board, you use West Debug. But if you want to start a GDB server that listens on a network port and you connect to it, um, that would be West Debug Server. And that's what Visual Studio Code connects to. It connects to the debug server target. I mean, not target, but when you run West Debug Server, it starts a GDB server and then the GDB inside of Visual Studio Code connects to it. Obviously, you can connect regular GDB to it from the command line. We also have tracing and the awesome feature uh, contributed by Daniel, which is Cordon which will dump out the registers and the memory state. And if you start up the core dump server, you can get a like a GDB state of the program at the time that it crashed, which I'll show you really helpful. Um, but sometimes in the end, like Andy always says, I mean, he basically only debugs with print K, even when he can't, like he doesn't need to. Um, sometimes you just have to print K. It just, it's just the way it is. So anyways, let's start the demo. Looks like I have plenty of time to do that. So here we are, a little harder to move around so I don't have my mouse, but this is the uh, Cordon sample, and I'm going to show you the visual debugging here and talk about kind of the limitations of it. I don't want to be in here. I want to be. Okay. 
So we want to start the debug server, right? We're going to build the whole app. And the debug server starts. What you do in Visual Studio Code, and I want to just show you how awesome it is. I have a target here for Hemu Extensa, which is weird. I don't know if a lot of people use it, but you just plug in these values and Visual Studio Code knows how to start the uh, GDB for that specific tool chain, which is here. I just give it the full path, what port to connect to, et cetera, what binary to use, and it'll just pop all that information in and you can visually debug. So it stops right here at the, basically the earliest point that it can, which is, um, you know, jump through the reset handler. So we have set a breakpoint in main here. This program, the core dump, what it does is that it deliberately triggers a hardware exception fault, whatever you want to call it, um, by dereferencing a null pointer. So, or depending on what, it depends on what uh, board you're on, but it triggers an exception. And then when that happens, we get a core down. So that's what the test is for, but we're just really trying to debug it. So here's our first breakpoint. We're going to jump ahead to it. See here, these are what you can work with. So here we are inside of the main function. And you can step into functions. Oh, looks like when I stepped into that one, it stepped all the, okay, that's the problem. Let me see. So this is also kind of a tangent here that I can talk about that you will not get normal debugging behavior if you don't have no optimizations in your file. So that could have been a lot worse if, I thought it was actually off. So I don't know what happened there, but anyways, Normally, it's pretty reliable. You can go into functions and out of them, but this time it decided to jump straight past this uh, null pointer reference and into the exception handler. So you can see here that you can actually scrub through a lot of the lower level Zephyr code, and you can see the whole call stack here. Like this is, we have exited the main program stack and we're running on the exception stack or the, the kernel stack here. So and it can actually like show you the state and you know, go all the way up the stack that it can. I mean, this is as far about as far as it goes. So you can see all the registers. It's just fantastic. Like compared to working with regular old GDB, um, regular old GDB has its strong points, especially in that it's not easy to navigate. Like the layout split, seeing the assembly code is not as easy. So let me show you here. You can see the assembly code, but it only, it won't highlight what like, what line you're on, unless you're on like x86 or a better supported architecture for GDB, um, but Zephyr, although I really love our port of Extenso, it's great, but it's not any easy to navigate the uh, assembly code and you can't start TUI, but what you can do is you can enter any command that you would normally give to GDB. You're not constrained by the, you know, the GUI. You can just, if you wanna know what's going on, you can type something like that. You can print, you know, the program counter where you are in the command uh, where you are in the program and you can also set breakpoints through here although visual studio code really won't wait be able to pick up on them um so do that at your own peril but you can you can do any pretty much about anything aside from starting a tui layout and trying to do that so um it has its advantages and disadvantages for me i use the visual debugger a lot because i find it very useful so yeah I don't know where we are anymore. I really hope it didn't crash. Why would we do this? Okay, well, that's unfortunate. Anyways, it like it doesn't normally do that. Oh, that's not good. Let's reopen that. But in the meantime, now that it's closed out and basically killed the debugging session, which it hasn't done for me before this very moment in all my rehearsal. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you, because I've basically showed you what the visual debugging looks like. I'm going to show you what the core dump does. And I like I kind of just kind of vomited a bunch of words at you about what it does, but I think it's cooler to show it in context. So if it'll work. OK, it's not going to work for me right now inside of here. But what I can do instead is the core dump, you get a binary on the command line. I'll just show you what that looks like. you what the so we have chemo extensa so you can see the autocomplete working there we're going to run oh my god why would you do that to me this is not well good thing i spe uh, speed run through the rest of my presentation because 
I think that was hard. So I'm going to show you the cordon. F. Bug. Nope. I want. Oh, subsys. Debug. So this is the output of Cordon. You can see here that this is all of the memory and this will tell you what happened, what the exception was for, um, you know, with the state of all the registers. And this is all great, but just seeing this output, this is the output normally put out by the, well, if you turn on some options, if you turn off them, you won't see this, but this is what you'll normally see if you have a fatal exception. This is the output of Cordon. And what we're gonna see in a second is what GDB can do for you with that output. So, We are going to start, I've already converted the log into a binary. I'm going to start the GDB server here. This is a separate thing from any of the Visual Studio Code debugging. This is actually not a formal, oh my God. There we go. Okay, wrong command. So this is really helpful if you're having a, okay, so it started. If you have, if you have like a fatal exception and you obviously can't debug directly up to that point, or maybe you're just connecting to something, you only have the log for it, you can still kind of run um, GDB and see what's going on. So, okay, here we go, we'll copy that. And now we'll restart the GDB server. So it started. Now we target remote local host. And here we are at the exact point where the program crashed. You can see what line it crashed on. You can see the full backtrace. You can move up and down that. You can do layout split. You can see what was going on. What was the assembly? You know, see all the registers layout. You can see all the registers and what was going on with them. So that's really helpful if you are working with a board that you can't directly debug onto. Like a lot of our work that we can do as kernel maintainers um, is you can get by with just extend the, uh, sorry, Kimu. But if you're working directly with the board as a user, this will be pretty much invaluable to you, I think, at least in my opinion. So that is, we're about three, seven minutes from the end. So I'll take a tangent to kind of talk about the limitations of visual debugging on hardware. So you can do visual debugging with Visual Studio Code on hardware. I've done it before, but it is not a pleasant experience because Visual Studio Code was not, it did not design its C, C++ debugging support with uh, embedded in mind. And if you are very enthusiastic about Visual Studio Code, please uh, contribute extended remote support. Because if we don't have extended remote support, like GDB extended or target extended remote, you can't restart the program after West flashes the board. So by the time that you connect, your program is already blown past any breakpoint you want to set. So what you can do instead is that you can kind of set an idle loop in main for about five to 10 seconds or anywhere else in the code really. It will of course change the behavior of the program, which is a problem. But if you're really trying to do something and you really want to Visual Studio Code debug your way through it, you can do this and you it'll give you time to start GDB up, set a breakpoint in GDB and then connect to the server. So when it's waiting, you set a breakpoint, you connect, and then finally it runs to the breakpoint and stops. So the other problem with Visual Studio Code debugging with real hardware is that it defaults to setting breakpoints as software, which may not work for your particular board. You can force the breakpoints to be hardware with your launch.json, or you can just set breakpoints in the console, but in which case the Visual Studio Code won't be aware of them. In terms of testing, which is pretty important for users and uh, contributors, we have a talk right after this, like directly right after this by Asta, also from Intel, and she's gonna give you an awesome explanation of Twister, which is our testing tool. Um, and also finally, in terms of running your upstream CI checks, I know that everybody 
hates it when they have like a upstream CI check failure and they're like, well, I ran check patch. Well, you didn't run check patch the exact way that CI runs it. So what you need to do is when you're having problems where you're running something locally and it's getting you different results than it's running upstream in the CI, what you need to do is take a look at the GitHub workflows folder and kind of reverse engineer your way. You don't need to like start up um, virtual box or start up some kind of like Docker container yourself. All you need to do is make sure that you have the packages installed in the workflow particular thing, like for check compliance, make sure that you have all the Python packages and et cetera installed. And then just, you know, run the command that is in actually in the file. So it will give you different results. I mean, Asta and I have also encountered this, that when you try to run the check patch that's in Zephyr, it doesn't behave the same way. So I would recommend that you come up with your own aliases for checking compliance and for building the docs because building the docs like, you know, with no prior, like just copying and pasting commands from somewhere else is not really fun. It's kind of hard. So um, here we are at the end. We have five minutes for questions that I didn't anticipate. I know that was a lot. It was pretty overwhelming, but um, if anyone has any questions, especially people from the Discord, Asta, do you have any questions? No? Okay, any questions? That's basically everything. If you really want to see the, um, oh, Amber has a, ignore my Discord messages, but there's a link in the presentation which is uploaded that you can follow to get to the uh, GitHub repo, which has, and you can play with this for yourself and it'll be a lot more interesting, I think. I have a sample kind of jank CC++, C, C++ properties JSON and a launch.json, which has GDB ARM uh, for Kimu, x86 Kimu, uh, extensive Kimu, and just some kind of experimental suggestions for what you might do with real hardware like ESP32 and native POSIX, which honestly I don't use a lot, but I know some people do. So, anyways, is there anything else? Not really. That's basically about it. Thanks for listening. Oh, and um, does anyone recognize my icon? anyone no okay never mind i was just hoping it's like the name of my thing so that's my presentation um thanks for coming to my ted talk and i'm gonna hand it over to asta to set up